maybe one, maybe two, or more, depending upon which. Half of them. Huh? Half of them. Half of them. <laughs> yeah. Now, nah, what do you say half? It just depends upon which side of the fence you're on. As to whether they're evil or not, right? All right. The kingdom of Israel existed for 208 years. The kingdom of Judah existed for several hundred years longer. But the kingdom of Israel existed for 208 years, from 930 B.C. until 722 B.C., when it was destroyed by Shalmaneser and the Assyrians. There were some 30 kings or more that reigned during those 200 years in the two years. <coughs> Five of the kings were good. All of the other kings, according to Scripture, were evil. And did more evil than some of their preceding kings. Ahab is now king of Israel. And the Bible describes him as the king who did more evil than all the kings before him. He was a wicked man. And he was married to a wicked woman. The woman's name was Jezebel. And whenever we think of the word or hear the name Jezebel, what comes to mind? The dogs. Huh? The dogs. The dogs. Okay. Remember the dogs? We'll come to back to that one. Okay? What else comes to mind? When you hear the word Jezebel, the word, the name Jezebel, what do you think of? Loose woman. Very loose. <laughs> yes, she was evil. What worship did she bring into the kingdom of Israel? Baal. Baal. She had every day at her table, eating with her, 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets or prophetesses of Ashtoreth, king and a queen, or a god and a goddess. And she was an evil woman. She died when she was thrown from the roof of her palace and hit the ground and the dogs ate her body, which was a prophecy of God towards her. Jezebel. But the worship of Baal had become foremost in the land of Israel. Now you remember Gideon and Baal? When Gideon was called up and destroyed his father's idol to, to Baal? And... Uh, <clears throat> His father was not really upset with him because he said to the people that were ready to kill Gideon, hey look, if Baal is God, let him contend for himself. Let him fight for himself if he's God. Otherwise, I'm not going to fight with him. I'm not going to fight with my son Gideon. Okay? Did Baal contend for himself? No. So because the kingdom of Israel had now turned to the worship of Baal, God sends a prophet to King Ahab. And the prophet is the prophet Elijah. Now, Elijah does not have a written book in the Old Testament. We don't have any written prophecies of Elijah. We have his words. And Elijah goes to Ahab and he says, and Ahab looks to him and he says, 
you troubler of Israel. She says, I'm not the troubler of Israel, it's you guy. <laughs> You're the one who's troubling Israel, and because of your deceit, of your leading your people into the worship of Baal, for the next three years there's going to be no rain. No rain. At all. Now we in Kansas have been in a drought recently. Okay, today we have nice overclass cast weather. We got gentle rain falling and all that, so we're not worried about floods, but we're getting the, the, the moist some of the moisture that we need. It would be better if it was snow, not ice, but snow so that it would cover the the the, the winter wheat. But it's okay, we, we'll take the rain. But Ahab was told, you are not going to have rain in your land for three years. And then Elijah disappears. Elijah goes across the river Jordan into uh, an area by a brook, the brook Hereth, and there God feeds Elijah for three years. Every morning the ravens come. They bring him meat and they bring him bread. Every evening the ravens come. And so Elijah is well fed. However, the people of Israel are suffering with the drought. And after three years, Ahab, or Elijah is told by God, go and find Ahab. Now Ahab has been looking for Elijah and he's ready to kill him. And so when he gets there and he says, Ahab, Elijah says, Ahab, uh, we've not had rain for three years, just as God said. Now, let's find out who is God. I want you, Ahab, to bring the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Ashtaroth, and I want you to bring them to the top of Mount Carmel. And there, we are going to have a contest. You and I are going to see which God is the true God. Bring all of your people and we're going to have a sacrifice. Now Mount Carmel, if you remember on a map of Israel, you'll see a little tip of land that comes out as you look at the, the, the coastline of Israel. It's normally just fat. There's a little flat. It's just a little hump that comes out. That's Mount Carmel. Okay? That's where all the rain first falls when it starts coming in. Okay? It's the first place that, that rain would fall in, in, in Israel. Even today. And so, up on Mount Carmel, Elijah takes two bulls, two sacrifices, and he says, okay, you prophets of Baal, you choose the bull. You choose the one that's going to be that you're going to sacrifice. And you take him and you put him on your altar and you call upon Baal to consume your sacrifice through fire, but you're not allowed to put fire on the altar. Ah, the prophets of Baal, they get their, their, their sacrifice, they put it on the altar, and then they start calling out to Baal to come down and bring fire and consume the altar offering. And they call. And they call. And nothing happens. And then they've been there all morning long, and and finally, Elijah gets to a point and says, Hey, what's wrong? Is Baal asleep and you can't wake him up? Maybe he's busy with some private business and he can't come out to consume his own. And he makes fun of those guys. And they begin to cry all the louder. And then they begin to take whips and swords and knives. And they begin to cut themselves trying to get Baal's attention. But Baal 
doesn't do anything. About the time of the evening offering, Elijah says, okay, you've had enough time. I'm going to do, I'm going to offer my sacrifice now. So he takes, and he takes the altar of God that has been destroyed and he builds it back with 12 stones, one representing each of the 12 tribes of Israel. He takes the stones, he builds the altar, he sacrifices the, uh, the, the, the bull, puts all of the meat on the altar, digs a moat around the altar, and then has his friends take and pour water three times on the offering. The offering is totally soaked with water. The altar is totally soaked with water. The pit around the altar is totally full of water. Can you talk about grandstanding? And the people are looking at Elijah and saying, you're crazy. And Elijah steps back and he cries out. He cries out to God and he says, let your fire fall from heaven so that these men and women who are surrounding us can see that you are God and you are God alone. And with one simple prayer, fire falls from heaven. All of the meat that has been soaked with water is consumed. All of the stones that the altar is made of are consumed with fire. All of the water that's in the moat evaporates with the fire of God that has come down from heaven. And God alone is the God of fire. God alone is the God who is to be worshipped by His people people who were once called by His name. And all of the people say, the Lord, He is God! And Elijah commands the death of all of the prophets and prophetesses. The nine of the 850 that are there. And the people kill them. And Elijah says to Ahab, you go back and you tell Jezebel what has happened on this mountain. And as Ahab is returning, Elijah begins to pray and he sends his servant to look to see if there's a cloud coming. See if there's rain coming. And finally, the servant says to Elijah, I see a small cloud. And that cloud grows and grows. And it moves in from the west and into the east to Mount Carmel and to the plains of, of the Shephelah of Israel and into the mountainous country of Israel. And rain comes the first time in three years. And Elijah goes down off of Mount Carmel and he runs to the city of Jezreel where the palace of Jezebel is located. Some 20 miles away and the Scripture says Elijah outran the chariot of Ahab who was kind of slogging through the mud. 20 miles he ran. A great victory for God and a man of God who speaks for God. And he gets to the city and he's expecting a triumphant welcome. I don't know what he's expecting, but he's expecting something more than what happens. And what happens is that Je uh, Jezebel sends word to Elijah. Elijah, because you have done this thing this time, by this time tomorrow, you're going to be dead. From the 
mountaintop to the valley. Just that quick. And Elijah flees for his life, afraid of one woman. He ends up in a cave, depressed, down near Beersheba. Runs the length of Israel, goes all the way from, from the Jezreel Valley, from the Valley of Armageddon, okay, all the way down through Samaria, through Jerusalem, through Bethlehem, and all the way down to Beersheba to hide from this one wicked woman whose God has already been proved to be impotent. But Ezra, I mean, but Elijah is in depression, afraid for his life, hiding in the cave. God wakes him up and says, what are you doing down here? Life is just, I'm the only one left, God. There ain't nobody left to worship you. God says, Elijah, you don't know what you're talking about. I have got 7,000 people in the land of Israel that have not bowed their knee to Baal. You are not alone. You go down to Mount Horeb. You go down to Mount Horeb in the Sinai Peninsula. You go down to the mountain where I met Moses. And there you wait for me to speak to you. And for 40 days, Elijah travels from Beersheba through the Sinai Peninsula to the desert of Sinai to Mount Horeb where God met with Moses. There he stays in a cave and, and God says to him, you wait until I speak to you. An earthquake comes. But God is not there. He's not heard. A storm comes. Yet God is not heard. God does not speak. And finally, there's a quietness. Elijah Elijah. Yes, Lord. In a still, small voice, God speaks to Elijah. And He tells him, you return and you carry out my word. You speak forth my word to my people. You know, many times we look for God in the magnificence. On Mount Horeb, when God came down to speak to the children of Israel and He spoke to the, the children of Israel and to Moses on the mountain, what was there? Thunder and lightning and noise as God spoke. But to Elijah, he speaks in a still, small voice. When you hear God speaking to you in a still, small voice, it's important that you listen. It's important that you do what He says to do. Maybe God sometimes speaks to you in a quiet and says to you, call this person. Write a note to this person. Go see this person. It doesn't matter what God says. It's important. You wake up in the middle of the night and you want to, to, to you don't know why you're awake, but something is saying pray. Pray for someone or for something. It's God speaking 
the same way he spoke to Samuel. Samuel. Here I am, Lord. Speak. Your servant hears. In dealing with the children of Israel, God used Elijah. God used Elisha. God used Amos. God used Hosea to speak to the children of Israel, to call them to repentance. He did mighty works to call His people to repentance. Yet they would not repent. He uses Hosea. Hosea is a prophet. He is a single man. He is called by God to speak to the children of Israel. And to share God's message with them. The people of Israel do not listen to Hosea. But Hosea listens to God because God says to Hosea, I want you to go to Gomer. And I want you to marry Gomer. Lord, you know who Gomer is, don't you? Gomer is a prostitute, God. Why do you want me to marry a prostitute? It'd be like telling a minister today that's single. Go to the red light district. Find that lady in the leopard skin leotards and the high heels and the short skirt. Pull her off the street, Mary. Think any minister would do that today? You think any minister that counsels a young man to go and do that would stay in the ministry very long? But God says, Hosea, go and marry Gomer. A prostitute. And Hosea obediently obeys. And he goes and he marries Gomer. They have three children. We're not sure if the children that they have are Hosea and Gomer's children or if they are children of prostitution. We do not know. And no matter how often Hosea expresses his love to Gomer, Gomer goes about her business of prostitution. How Hosea stayed married to that woman, I do not understand. I do not know only the fact that he was being obedient to God. And, who, and Gomer leaves and is gone for some time. And finally, God says to, Gomer, to Hosea, Hosea, go find your wife Gomer. And so Hosea goes out and goes into the town and he goes around looking and finally he comes to the place where Gomer is staying. Instead of seeing a man standing there who she is planning on pleasing, she finds Hosea. Hosea looks at his wife, Palmer, and says, Palmer, come home. Come home, Palmer. It's time for you to leave your ways and come home and stay with me. And I will continue to love you. God does the same thing to His people. God knows we live down here on a 
evil level, a lower level of the story. And He knows that we have been disobedient to Him. And He knows that sometimes we have, to go, we have gone after gods of lesser importance than He is. Sometimes it's a God of work. Sometimes it's a God of pleasure. Sometimes it's, it's a God of the internet. Sometimes it's a God of the television and all the reality shows that people love to watch and see the evil of mankind as they try to beat each other out in those reality shows. It doesn't matter what God we put in front of the Lord God Almighty. And sometimes we have gone astray and, and people that are, are watching this on television, if they're watching and if they hear, it may be that you have gone astray. Maybe you have left your first love of, of God and maybe you have gone after another idol. But God is like Hosea. And when you open the door, He says, come home. Throughout the time of the existence of the kingdom of Israel, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. But God sent messengers to them to call them back to repentance. To call them to a renewal and an, obediently, an obedient walk with Him. And God says, come home. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling calling for you and for me. See on the portals. He's waiting and watching. Watching for you and for me. Come home. Come home. Ye who are weary, come home. Tonight or today, we're going to stand and we're going to sing a invitation, a hymn of dedication. But it's going to be a time when we hear God speak to us. And I don't know all of your lives. I don't know all the things that are happening in your lives, whether it be here, those of you who are here in this room this, at this moment, or those who might be watching on television. But God speaks and He says, Come home. If you're weary of the life that you're having and the struggles that you're having, come home. Trust in me. I'm the God of fire who can consume an altar soaked with water. I am the God who speaks in a still small voice. Come on. Let's stand. Let's stand.